the land of conjurers flying through the internet to your device like a UAP, hauntingly unexplained and downright weird. This is the witching hours, and we are ready to take off in the flash of an eye. Good evening to one and all, wherever and whenever you are listening to this program. I am China the Frost, and joining me, as always, is my wonderful co-host, Medium Jenny Lee. How are you doing, Jenny? Frantically trying to finish typing my sentence in the chat so I can unmute my microphone. <laughs> I'm doing good. How are you? Doing, doing, <laughs> doing well. Doing well. Excited for the show tonight. Uh, we were gone last week, right? I don't think, yeah, we kind of had uh, a cancellation. Yeah, so we had a cancellation. And so yeah. we, I think we played, I think we went on one of our other streams and played some Baldur's Gate 3. So we had a little bit of a chill, chill Thursday last Thursday. So we're back and we're ready to, uh, we're ready to rock and roll, I guess. Yay. As they say. <clears throat> um, uh, just a note uh, coming up. Uh, we're back with the whole uh, line of shows. Uh, next week, we're going to have Haunts of Richmond on. Uh, so we're going to talk oh, cool. about some haunted places and, well, close to our hometown of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and we'll talk about some significant places there and their personal experiences from some friends we met at the uh, Hanover Tavern Paracon. Uh, we're going to yeah. have Mark Hunter Brooks back on on uh, May 2nd, uh, which is going to be a great Club. show. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have Rob Khalil on from the typical uh, uh, typical uh, skeptic podcast that you were just on, and yeah, that our friend and Robert, Robert was, on. was just on. Yeah, so <laughs> we he's were gonna on come back on. To back. <laughs> and I think I think we might just end up talking about Art Bell for half the show, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. There's a lot of I figured that it'll just about. be you two talking about Art Bell, and I'll be sitting here twiddling my thumbs. There's worse. <laughs> there's worse things to talk about. Right, especially oh, yeah, in election yeah. year, I'll take our bell conversation any, any oh, day of the yeah, week. Yeah, so. we can. Yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> All right, so uh, you ready to get into some news? Yeah, what you got for us this week? All right. All right. All right, so we're leading off tonight. This has a little bit to do with uh, some stuff we've been dabbling around with. But anyway, uh, tarot card reading predicts Michigan woman's $500,000 lottery win. Uh, a Michigan woman said a tarot card reading correctly predicted she would win a $500,000 lottery prize later that same day. The 59-year-old uh, Janice County woman told Michigan lottery officials she was on her way to the tarot card reading when she stopped at the BP gas station uh, to buy some scratch off tickets during my tarot mm. reading. I was told money would be coming into my life very soon. I tried to think of the ways that this might happen, but I didn't even think about the lottery <laughs> tickets in my purse. The player recalled later that night, I scratched the tickets. I saw the star symbol and thought, well, at least I won my money back. Assuming it would be a $10 win much to her surprise. She revealed a $500,000 prize. I tried to remain wow. calm. But I knew right then and there, this had just changed my life, she said. The woman's prize came from uh, 50 times wild time scratch off ticket. The winner said her plans for the prize money includes paying off her car, taking a cruise with a friend, and investing the remainder of the money. Is she going to give a little extra to the tarot reader? Yeah. 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 A little tip. Give her a tip. A little tip. A little tip. Yeah. Uh, and I will say to go along with this, we did a, uh, on your stream, we did a spell jar and potion stream. We did. And we did, uh, we had a luck potion and we had like an abundant spell jar that we did. We did. And we decided that might be a good time to purchase a lottery ticket. We did. We didn't win $500,000. <laughs> we didn't win anything. Although the scratch well, we did, thing, we, we won $60. We won $60. So yeah. I'll take that. So I'll take and we don't $60. ever play the lottery. We play like we once never... every couple of years. We'll buy like maybe a even a couple of years. Ticket. Maybe like once every five years yeah. or something. So yeah. we we spent like three bucks and we won sixty. So I'll I'll take it. It's uh, money I guess in the, the spell jar and the potion were. <laughs> and that's not were enough. Good. We gotta worry about people, you know, calling us and trying to borrow money for their mortgage. You rate. almost made me spit my drink out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel comfortable revealing our, our $60 <laughs> jackpot. $60. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, story goodness. number two, unidentified submerged objects. Officially, the U.S. government has no proof that sightings of unidentified aerial phenomenon are a result of alien activity. I don't know. That's debatable. 
Apparently, though, the uh, definitely probably not aliens have been observed operating unidentified. <laughs> definitely submerged, probably not aliens. Yeah, ob submerged objects in our oceans. Uh, they fly too, but they uh, when they want, they just disappear beneath the waves without a trace. Retired mm -hmm. Rear Admiral Tim uh, Galladay, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, is sounding the alarm on UFOs that can disappear into the water without a splash and without leaving any wreckage behind. Mm. These USOs are an urgent national security concern with world-changing scientific ramifications, he says. And he claims to have proof, too, sharing a video of an unidentified object recorded by the USS Omaha back in 2019. The video has been verified by the Pentagon and shows an object flying around the ship before dropping into the water and disappearing. I have put that video over in our Discord channel in the Weird News. So if you want to see the video of the uh, USO, you can uh, wander over there and check it out. Uh, the fact that unidentified objects with unexplainable char characteristics are entering U.S. water space and the DOD is not raising a giant red flag is a sign that the government is not sharing all it knows about all domain anomalous phenomena, said the well, retired yeah. rear admiral. I mean, don't we know? We knew that already. Yeah. <clears throat> it's entirely possible that the object and others like it are simply advanced aircraft. Uh, but uh, the, the rear admiral doesn't think so. So uh, once again, just another high-ranking military official uh, who's coming out to shine some light uh, don't know what it means, but it's out there and you can go check out the video and it's pretty, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's worth watching. I'll put it that way. Cool. Something that we've talked about recently, I think I might have brought this up when we were just, uh, you know, trying to find a movie to watch or something recently. Uh, but Steven Spielberg's next project is going to be a UFO movie. Hmm, cool. Uh, aliens and UFOs have long been a favorite topic of Spielberg. Uh, just last year, he... Uh, he, he was the executive uh, producer of that Netflix show, Encounters. And oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. prior to that, he produced uh, both Taken and Falling Skies. And of course, uh, he is also uh, the director of Close Encounters, Close of, the Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but according to Variety Magazine, uh, he says he's back in alien mode. And cool. that he is going to be working on a UFO extraterrestrial picture. And it's going to be based on his own original idea. So, I think he's for, had uh, think he's had any ET contact? All of his stuff he's made. Uh, there was another quote in the article that I uh, that I didn't get, but it was basically talking about just a fascination with the the idea that he believes that uh, other life has to exist in the universe, mm -hmm. paired with the fact that he doesn't think it's very possible for them to actually come here. So he's kind of split. Like he he mm -hmm. knows he thinks he knows that life exists. But mm -hmm. according to the science, he's not sure what the likelihood is that they're coming to Earth. Didn't he, do, to uh, <clears throat> didn't he do E.T. also? Yeah, he, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did E.T. Yeah, and he did, yeah. Um, another really good Spielberg movie that I feel like almost gets kind of left over because it's really long is uh, A.I. AI was really good, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's pretty crazy. And speaking of movies, uh, I don't have this in my news and notes here, but um, there is a, uh, there is a uh, Bigfoot movie out right now. Um, what really? Yeah, it's uh, it follows I think four Bigfoot. Um, mm -hmm. it's it's just like actors playing Bigfoot, oh. uh, but it's like you know like no dialogue, like it's supposed to be shot like it's really following like four. Uh, Yeti's around. Okay. Um, uh, I'll get the name of it real quick. Might be a movie night. Um, <laughs> it's not quickly Hoekster popping said, up. Hoekster said he's the Bigfoot actor. Don't, he's not allowed to talk about it. It's got some, actually, it's got some pretty big <laughs> actors in it. I'll see if I can, uh, Brad it's, uh, it's called, it's a called Sas Sasquatch Sunset is the name of it. Oh, for crying out loud. I couldn't have come up with a better name. Um, <laughs> Sasquatch Sunset and okay. looking at the cast, it's got um, Jesse Eisenberg. Okay. And Kieran Culkin. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, it's definitely going to be a weird one. It's definitely a weird one. So Might much that people team, are leaving the theaters because it's showing the, the natural habits of creatures. So anyway, it's definitely a watch for us. 
And I this will be a that team weird movie night. Be a watch for a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. If you didn't know it exists, uh, that that exists right now. Um, okay. And, and that, stuff I need to know. That leads into our last story of the night. Uh, uh, okay. We talked about this when it first happened, but it's back mm-hmm. in the news again. So we're going to share the story again. A man accused of murdering his friend he thought summoned Bigfoot. Oh yeah. He was found guilty. Oh, so the Pontotoc County man who told investigators he killed his friend during a fishing trip because he thought the man was summoning Bigfoot to kill him Mm. was convicted Wednesday afternoon. A judge ruled that Larry Sanders 55 is guilty of murdering Jimmy Knighton in July of 2022. The conviction hinged on the concept of malice aforethought. According to closing arguments, both prosecutors and the defense attorneys agreed that Sanders unlawfully killed Knighton, but a first degree murder conviction in Oklahoma requires proof of malice aforethought. Um, kind of skipping along here, he says, this is Sanders speaking, or, or sorry, the, the attorney for Sanders. In a first degree uh, murder case in Oklahoma, as in most other states, you have an element of malice aforethought, meaning that you have to have specific intent to cause the death of another. Uh, we were able to prove that Larry Sanders caused that death. And the, uh, and the issues of malice of forethought is what that truly hinged on. Uh, but we have quotes from Sanders here, and he says that, um, so, he, so Sanders, the, kill, uh, the person who was convicted of the murder, reportedly confessed to killing Knighton during interviews, uh, and he took the stand Wednesday and told the courtroom about the fishing trip that turned deadly, saying he thought that uh, strange things began happening that July afternoon. Sanders claimed to see a 12-foot-tall, Bigfoot downstream and hear Knighton mm-hmm. howl into a drainage pipe. Sanders said that Knighton had pointed out a fish to him and was telling him to get that fish. Sanders said when he told Knighton he didn't want to get that fish, Knighton kept telling him to. Sanders told the courtroom that he began to feel suspicious and believed Knighton was planning on drowning him and floating his body downstream to feed him to the Bigfoot. Mm. Later on that afternoon, Knighton and Sanders got into a physical fight. And so uh, he ended up uh, choking him to death. Good Lord. So Bigfoot turns deadly uh, with no Bigfoot on the scene. Maybe. I mean, we don't know. Could have been. <laughs> Anyways, that was the weird news. Uh, some weird news. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, we are back tonight uh, with guest uh, Robert Bitto. Author Robert Bitto has had over... 30 years experience in Mexico as a student and employee of a large multinational corporation as the owner of an imports business founded in 1999. Uh, Suenos Latin American Imports, he was a professional researcher from 1990 to 93. In addition to his MBA and BBA, Robert holds an MA in Latin American Studies from the University of New Mexico. From 2015 to 16, he served as the San Diego chapter president of Mensa and has published three books and a coloring book and has been the host of the popular podcast and YouTube channel Mexico and explained since 2016. Please welcome to the show once more, everybody, uh, Robert Bitto. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thanks for having me again. It was fun the last time, and I know we're going to have a lot of fun again. I think so. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Speaking of the coloring book, so after you sent this, you so graciously sent me the coloring book, um, we actually did a stream where we colored i let this the chatters choose what we were going to color and we listened to your stories about them at the same time so oh we wow. colored this lovely uh handsome fella <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and then we did everybody's favorite bigfoot uh the shy one we had to color him because oh, he was like you know great. he's like the sweet wow. bigfoot <laughs> right yeah cool awesome. yeah so we've been putting it to good use great so you also sent us this your new book is uh mexican miracles yeah that's and, uh, number three yeah. in the series yeah. yeah so uh i was hoping that we could start with that um and I haven't had a chance to read through it all, but I've been flipping through it and listened to some of the podcasts that go along with it. What is your, what do you feel like was the most fascinating miracle story in your new book? Oh, that's a hard, that's a hard <laughs> choice to make. There's a lot of different things because Mexico is a land of 
deep religious faith and lots of miracles. Um, there is one story that's near the back of the book, mm -hmm. and it's about a, a holy spring, Tlacole. There is a there is a spring that in a weird um in a weird sort of way that's not very conventional, the person who owned the land where that spring was opened it up to the public for free. And people were coming with jugs and any sort of canisters they could to fill up this, you know, to fill up with this magic spring water. Mm -hmm. And it attracted some famous people, including Magic Johnson. Ooh. And yeah, there are are people who are saying that this miraculous water can cure anything. Wow. And, you know, it's interesting that there was a Magic Johnson sighting down there, because mm -hmm. if you know anything about his health status, he was diagnosed with a f fatal disease, mm -hmm. and he's doing fine now. Yeah. You know? You don't, mm -hmm. he's fathered children, he's mm -hmm. had a, a very normal life, and some people attribute it to these waters. Now, new people have taken over the place, and they've kind of limited access and stuff, but yeah, that that was probably one of the most interesting stories that I covered, I think, because it was miraculous he healing waters and the the person who was in charge of the land let anybody go on to the land and yeah. fill up their buckets and stuff with it. But that's, you know, that was an interesting story, but it's a pretty typical story of of the ones in my book. There's a lot of different things that go on down in Mexico that have this religious and magical bent, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about some of the stuff last time, but yeah, there's plenty. There's plenty to talk about as far yeah. as that stuff goes. Yeah. Magical Mexico. There was uh there was another um uh magical water one I think I listened to the podcast for. Was that the one that had something to do with um like the Angel Michael or something like that? Yeah, there was um an angel, yeah, Saint Michael, the archangel, mm -hmm. appeared to a young boy, and told him to dig a well at a certain spot, that's right. and that mm -hmm. well had curative powers. And that's a unique story in Mexico because whenever an apparition happens, if it's the Virgin Mary or a Jesus apparition or some other saint, there was a bilocating nun that appeared one time. Um, there, these these people or these apparitions are always bringing messages of kindness and love one another and all of this stuff. But this is the one exception that I can find in all of my research because Archangel Michael was very mean and, <laughs> you know, you guys better obey or falling away from the faith. And, you know, that's why there is a plague here. And that's why all these people are sick and everything. And you need to do what I'm saying. And yes, so he came down and and with a lot of force, and yeah. so they obeyed him and they built this well and um, yeah. So you can still go there today, but it was responsible for curing a plague that was going on at the time. Well, you know, I mean, I think maybe angels would get tired of our crap too because we just don't ever <laughs> listen or follow directions, you know. <laughs> but it's interesting because. That's the only incident that I can think of where the the apparition was stern, you know, yeah. all the other times, you know, Jesus appeared after an earthquake in the clouds and he was like, everything's going to be OK. Mm -hmm. Or the Virgin Mary appear, appears and says, love one another. There's always the there are all of these very nice messages and everything but this angel was not pleased i wonder if it's because down. it was children and perhaps the children had the perspective that he was being strict and 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 mean you know maybe it was the perspective of the children and not necessarily that he was you know being snippety oh, it could be yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know. Just just something to think about, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So like some of the stuff we're talking about tonight, because uh, some people who are here listening to this may not have heard the first time or might not be familiar uh, as we were talking about a little bit before the show about these miracles and about the unexplained things in Me- Mexico. Why do you think we get so many more, I don't know, in my opinion, uh, of, of these kinds of stories from Mexico and such a wealth of uh, mythos and such a wealth of unexplained things and miracles in Mexico itself? Well, because there is very long history that's unbroken that goes back thousands of years. So when you have a long unbroken history like that, and then you have a population who's very much connected to that history, they're very Mm -hmm. open to these mythological things and, and the paranormal and anything else, really, the modern day versions of the paranormal UFOs, things like that. Um, So you have this long unbroken history. Some of the legends that are down there go back thousands of years. Some of the witch legends, some of the shape shifting legends. And so people have been softened up, I think, over the thousands of years and even into the modern age. People may look at Mexico as a very superstitious place, but I think maybe they're just more open to believing in things. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think be it. I think that's a great answer because I think I think that's part of it. Like if you're not open to recognizing those things, we, we talked about this recently about the fact that it's really easy to ignore it. You don't think it would be, but it's really easy to come across, in my opinion, anyway, something that if unless you kind of stop and go, okay, that that's not just weird. Like that's kind of that's kind of uh, an awesome thing that occurred, but because it's kind of outside our normal viewpoint of everyday life, you know, waking up and getting to work and getting the kids fed and all those things that you do throughout a day. It's almost easy to be like, okay, I'm tossing that aside. That doesn't, (laughs) that's not working with my worldview right now. And so I think, yeah, that, that could be a big explanation for it is people, they're more open to seeing the things that are happening. Right now, if, if someone in, in Kansas or even here in California said, came up to you and said, I know that statue gets up and walks at night. You know, I know it. And I, you know, I, I believe, and I know it. most Americans would go, what, huh? What? Who's responsible for this person? You know, <laughs> yeah. Let, let's get this person some help. But yeah, Someone actually said that to me. An older woman said those words to me. You know, that Santo Nino, that that Christ child that's in this shrine. I was in this little little town and she said, you know, he walks around in the middle of the night and he goes and he does miracles. Look at his shoes are worn on the bottom. It's because he walks around in the middle of the night and people down there listen to it. Oh, yeah. Cool. I know. She doesn't need to be committed. She believes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. she has faith. You don't have faith. What's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> what a big difference. <laughs> your mind isn't open to it. Why are you so closed off? Why is your heart closed? People will say that your heart's closed. Mm-hmm. You're, you're closing yourself off, you know, to to this sort of stuff. You need to open up and believe, you know, like because that. when I went down there, like, when I was a college student down there in 1989, way, way back when, right? I was Mr. You know, nose in the books and skeptical about everything. And mm-hmm. I was staying with a family and they were like, God, what's wrong with Robert? He just doesn't <laughs> want to, he doesn't want to believe in anything. And, and <clears throat> the senora said to me, isn't the world a better place with belief? When you when you see the miracles, isn't the world a better place? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> however, what she said must have really I'm stuck with you so have because different... we've got this book, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You opens and, your um, heart, Robert. Yeah, so you that. It up. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. And that was when I when I was a student down there in 1989, I was in Morelia, Michoacan. And it, that's a a magical town. You know, it's a it's a colonial town. And I was right down there in the middle of the heart of the old city. 
And if you ever watched, if you've ever seen the movie Frida Kahlo, that Frida Kahlo movie, mm -hmm. the scenes of Mexico, that's like, that was like the backdrop of my life when I was down there. Yeah. I was, you know, living in an old building and I was walking to school on cobblestones that were put down in the 1550s. And wow. it was, yeah, it was. And, you know, I guess when, in 1989, I really didn't appreciate it as much as I do now, you mm -hmm. know, because oh, yeah. I was nose in the books and I've got to study. And they were, she was worried about me too, that I wasn't going out and meeting people and going to the Colibri nightclub with the young people or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, no, I have a test tomorrow. And, you know, and stuff, you should go out, you should do this and that and the other thing. And I'm like, no, I've got to study. And <laughs> I was all serious and stuff. You were, all, you were an old fuddy-duddy in your, in your college. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I guess so. I took it too seriously. I did enjoy yeah. myself down there, though. Okay. I, I took advantage <laughs> of it. And, you know, that was the spark that led to my business that I've mm -hmm. owned now for almost 25 years. This September 16th will be... 25 years since I started my business that I own where I import arts and crafts and I go down to Morelia all the time. Awesome. In fact, on the first buying trip that I went down there, I, I stopped with the senora and the family and I, you know, hung out with them and she actually went to a couple towns with me and helped me negotiate prices yeah, and stuff. Cool. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, awesome. it's all been a very interesting ride. Yeah. So was the was that time frame when you were also like a tour guide at the pyramid? That was in two thousand four and two thousand five. Okay, so that was I much was far recent, right? And i I had my I started my retail store in my business in nineteen ninety nine, and then what happened is people would come in my store and say, you know, it'd be really neat to see where these things are made. Do you need help on your buying trips? And it was mostly upper middle class women who were asking me this because mm -hmm. they had this idea in their head that my buying trips were like something out of a, a Pier <laughs> One commercial or something where mm -hmm. they get to dress up in this safari outfit with a pit <laughs> helmet and have a and mm -hmm. have a, a clipboard and and tell people where, you know, and I was like, uh, you know, people would. Th these women would say that to me and I said, well, do you speak Spanish? Do you speak Portuguese? Oh, well, no. <laughs> um, you know, so buying trips, even now, OK, buying trips are still gritty. You know, I stay up late because I have to maximize my time down in country. And, you know, I'm loading trucks sometimes myself doing the physical labor. You know, I'm very active in this and I'm going to out of the way places like we've talked about before in my mm -hmm. other appearance. So I go to these little towns. These these people would probably not enjoy that. So what I did is I came up with this this hybrid thing and mm -hmm. I said, OK, you can go with me down there for a week and I'll show you different places and we'll go to workshops and stuff and we'll hit the tourist attractions. I'll be your tour guide. And so, you know, one of that part of that was the pyramids at Teotihuacan. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, guiding there. That's so cool. among other places. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How, I don't know how often Dr. you went or how many how many times you were there. <laughs> yeah, right. But no, Johnny you, Quest. Not, <laughs> no, did, you have, did you have any weird experiences? Uh in that particular area or any of the other really um, ancient historical places? Have you have you yourself had any unusual experiences? Well, I wouldn't say unusual. I, that's a tough question because sometimes mm -hmm. you feel things, mm -hmm. you know. I went to one out of the way ruin site and um, I hired like I think I explained last time, I hire people sometimes to drive me around. We go to out to the towns and, you know, so I hired a driver and he said there were some ruins here and we went to the ruins. And before he went into the ruins, he said a little prayer in Otomi, the language Otomi. He said a little prayer 
that his grandfather taught him before you enter ruins, you're supposed to ask permission to go. Mm -hmm. And then, so he said the prayer and I said, I want to say it too. And so I repeated it after him and we walked into the ruins and this breeze came mm. and the breeze, I looked at him and we both smiled at each other and the breeze made us feel happy. It was weird. And I was not feeling very happy. <laughs> no, it was a, it was an exhausting by trip. And mm -hmm. I, we went to the ruins as kind of like a break. Right? Yeah. And then, so it was a happy place. It, I felt happy after I said that prayer and we walked in to these yeah. ruins that were off the beaten path and hadn't really been excavated or whatever. So that's one little story. I mean, there's there's yeah. so much to talk about. There's sounds, a lot of sounds like uh, like the uh, spirit of the land or the spirit of the people or the spirit of the ruins was like thanking you guys for asking permission. Yeah. And I yeah. I mean, I when he said the prayer, I said, I, I want to do it, too. I, yeah. you know. And he looked at me like I was kind of strange. And why, would a, <laughs> why would a gringo? Why did I go? First of all, it's weird I'm speaking Spanish. You know, when I go down there, a lot of people say, you know, we've we've gotten visitors from the United States, but you're the first one to speak our language to us. You know? <laughs> and I was, well, how else am I supposed to No, But um, yeah, so he he gave me this really weird look like you really want to say that? I said, yeah, I do. And it was good. And I'm glad I went. Yeah. Because like I said, it wasn't that buying trip was rough. It was it was February of 2019 and it was it was just rough. So I that was, was definitely was not one that you take much. the white the white ladies with their little dogs on. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Their little dogs in their purse, right? Yeah. Um yeah, but it was funny. When I did do those tours, it was um mostly widows who were on, you know. It was interesting. Wealthy yeah. widows mm -hmm. and, you know, a mix of other people, too. But of all the things that I've done, that was probably the most fun way yeah. to earn money was to be mm -hmm. the tour guide. And, you know, it was that was a lot of fun at sharing all of this stuff with people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I have well, another question to kind of that kind of piggybacks off Jenny. And maybe maybe you already answered it with that question, but I'll ask it anyway, which is. You said earlier that you were kind of, when you first went down there, you were kind of in the books, you kind of were closed off to kind of uh, the things that they were talking about there. Why did that change? Obviously you do Mexico and explain now, uh, you've written books. What happened for you that kind of turned it around to where you would do write and do uh, podcasts and stuff about those things? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. That's a very good question. I guess because once I once I left school, I was in the world of reality. You know, school is not reality. And people who are in in college and take it seriously, they want to get that degree and they want to get a great career going and all of that stuff. But then. I think those serious younger people soften up. Well, I hope they do, because I did. <laughs> and <laughs> there were too many things, I guess, over the course of time, there were too many things that were smacking me in the face. And there was a lot of obvious stuff coming at me. You know, when you walk into a church or something and you get a feeling you know, or you walk into another place or you see an art object. And then also, you know, I was I went from school to corporate America and I got a job in Mexico City, you know, with a major U.S. company that's been around since the 1850s, you know, very. Yeah was awful <laughs> so they, you know they 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 sent me to mexico city and then they transferred me to sao paulo brazil and then i went back to phoenix and then all the while when i was in latin america i was traveling around and i was getting the idea for my imports business so i slowly softened up i think to these things and then 
the the big aha moment happened when I was on a plane. And I don't know if I mentioned this before in the last show or not, because I repeat this story a lot. <laughs> I was on a plane and I was opening up a paranormal magazine, Muy Interessante. And then I got, you know, I said, gosh, you know, there's this article about crop circles and I've never seen this before in the U.S., these certain crop circles, the analysis by Mexican scientists. And I was like, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that doesn't, that doesn't leave the the Mexico border with the U.S. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. leave Mexico. So then that's that whole softening up process led to that moment, that aha moment. And then I put that in the back of my head and then I started the podcast a few years later. And, you know, I guess I'm still being softened up because <laughs> because you know what and it's all thanks to the listeners and the watchers of the show because the mm -hmm. comment section is like gold people will will contribute or correct me mm -hmm. but please do me the courtesy of correcting me if you do find I'm making a mistake please mm -hmm. especially if you're from the place that I'm talking about yeah so i've been humbled by people adding to what I'm saying and teaching me things and everything. So, yeah, because you said yeah. a lot of a lot of times people put their own stories that are relevant to the topic in the comments, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. So it's like just more validation of backing up the things that you're bringing forward. Is these and then, yeah, things. and then yeah. adding and adding to it, too, and giving me another perspective. You know, like we talked about, I think, in the last show about giants. Mm -hmm. Well, giants built the pyramids and then me, Mr. Skeptic, I come and say, well, how could they how can they build the pyramids? Because they have a size seven shoe. Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. what the step looks like for somebody with a size seven shoe. And there mm -hmm. I thought that was the end of the argument. But then someone <laughs> came in the comment section and said, well, those staircases were added later. How about that? And I yeah. thought, well, gosh, I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. you know, so maybe that is true. Yeah. So, yeah, I like the the interaction with with the the viewers and the listeners. It, it's really it's really beneficial, it really adds a lot. So speaking of giants, uh, Frosty had a question about one you just posted. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about that. I wanted to uh, piggyback off the last statement, though, because I, I kind of have the same experience when you're talking about, you know, what was going on in school and kind of that mind frame. It is difficult when you're doing academic stuff. So like I was already into a lot of this stuff and had read books and listened to a lot of late night radio and and had lots of conversations about that. And then I went to school to be a historian. And I had, and it's almost like mandatory that you are, that you have to cut that off a little bit um, because you get into such a process of having to like, everything has to be backed up by academic sources and academic sources don't write about giants typically, right? They, they don't talk mm -hmm. about. In um, America, we have the opposite. Close. It's not open your heart. Mm -hmm. It's close that thing yeah. down. And so even now, uh, you know, uh, you know, I finished up my degrees. Uh, it's still a process, I think, of almost like opening some of those things back up that you got kind of had to close down to be able to get through. And that's not to say that it's that it's bad or wrong. It's just something different, I think, a different way of, of looking at it. So but it, it's beneficial. So I totally get where you're coming from with that. Uh, but what Jenny uh, was talking about. Yeah. So uh, if you go over to Mexico and explain, make sure you go over there uh, that the link is up uh, in the chat. It'll be if you're listening later, it'll be down below in the comments section. Uh, go over to Mexico and explained over on YouTube and uh, put in a sub over there uh, and, uh, and and check it out. It's definitely worth uh, the views. You're missing, worth your time. If you're not listening or watching, you're missing out. There's like so many. I mean, there's so many different topics. There's something there for everybody. It, it, it really, it, anything and everything, uh, it, whatever you're into in this in this woo woo world, there's something uh, there for you to check out for sure. <laughs> plenty, plenty. Um, so what I wanted to ask specifically was we talked about the Seri people uh, and and I was kind of we talked about giants last time and I thought that was an interesting connection there. Do you want to explain a little bit about uh, those people and some of their origin stories and stuff? Well, they are in the northwestern deserts of Mexico and they were they were in territory that nobody wanted. OK, 
And they're kind of a mysterious people because they're a language isolate and their language is not related to any of the other indigenous languages around them. So they were pretty much culturally intact until the late 19th century. And so there were a lot of anthropologists, especially from the United States, saying, let's go down there and get some history from these people and let's document their legends. And so one of their a big part of their creation story is that the world first was inhabited by giants. And then basically the giants were wiped out by a flood and then little people were created to replace them. And so and the giants, you can still go to the desert and the big cactus that exists in the desert the Seri people believe that those are the giants that just mm -hmm. that died in place. And yeah. each one of those, uh, each cactus has a spirit. And if you're among those, the cactus, you're supposed to be very respectful when you're walking around because those are the, those are the remnants of the first people. Wow. And it's ironic. It's interesting that, you know, once again, we have a world that was wiped out by a flood. Yeah. No. How many of those like stories heard do we have before. to have? <laughs> yeah, there, were, there, were, yeah. there were giants you know, in those days. The, the, the giants main, in those days, that's right, exactly. Right. And the main, <laughs> the main um, culture of Mexico, when the Spanish arrive, they believe that, I believe their fourth son, their fourth iteration of the world, was completely destroyed by a feminine deity who flooded the world. And because she was ruling the world and became, you know, angry at what was going on. And then the whole world got destroyed. And then now we're in the fifth sun. We're in the fifth iteration of the world. Mm -hmm. But it, that was controlled by a feminine spirit and feminine spirits. And then that was destroyed once again by, you know, a great flood. Yeah. So. There's way, way, way too many of those stories from all over the world that it just... It has to be, it yeah, has to there, be truth in it. There, yeah. I mean, I mean, like all different continents, you mm -hmm. know, it all lines up for like the, the same time frames. And, you know, obviously people go back to the Christian story of Noah and the flood, but we know it predates that all the way back to ancient mm -hmm. Sumer and the tablets, mm -hmm. the Sumer tablets and cuneiform and all that that were found. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just, you know, at some point in time, you know, maybe sometimes we always say there there are no coincidences, but maybe sometimes there are coincidences. But you couldn't pay me enough to make me believe that that was a coincidence. Yeah, no way. You know? um, so so that's interesting. More more giants, and that's something. I you know this might have been what we were discussing last time, but it's just getting to a point where it's kind of interesting because there becomes a, a, a more and more historical evidence for giants but i've but it almost seems like that topic has been more forgotten about like people are talking about a lot of other things giants aren't coming up as much as it used to but i feel like there's probably more if like you're looking at trying to prove something i feel like that's probably something that is more i don't know a more easier subject to try to get to yeah, but then then you have people who will counter that and say, where's the where are the bones? You know, and I think I yeah. mentioned that in the last show mm -hmm. that I was that I was on with you about. Yeah, I think we did. In the past 50 years, there's been a lot of digging, a lot of building all over the world because mm -hmm. population has just boomed. Yeah. So shouldn't, you know, here in San Diego, let's say in the, the suburbs, they're building a new uh, subdivision of homes, let's say. How come we haven't stumbled on giant bones in these new subdivisions or, or in shop when shopping centers are being built or whatever? That's a big question that I have. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but. Yeah. Well, uh, we had a story uh, not that long ago, and I do think this has been since you've been on. Uh, where they found a seven foot sword. Uh, was that a, a, a Viking grave they found with a seven foot sword? No, that was in Japan. Oh, that was in Japan. That's right. Oh, wow. yeah. Seven foot sword. 
with a uh, uh, with a coffin that was like ten feet long or something, um, oh, yeah. which is interesting. And they were trying to say that it was used for decoration, but like, who's going to be buried with a sword that's seven feet long? And who needs and, a ten foot coffin? <laughs> and you know what? A so how old was that? Because to make a sword that big would take a lot of resources and a lot of effort. Would. I would think. I'll actually, uh, if yeah. if Jenny wants to keep talking, I'll find the story here. Yeah, it's worth bringing up. I don't, uh, I don't remember how old it was. Uh, but Luce has a question. Here we um, go. I have it right here. So a okay, go ahead. sword found uh, a, a sixteen hundred years old. Wow. Yeah, so that would have been. That would have taken a lot of effort to do that long ago. Yeah. Yes, a seven so. and a half foot long iron sword and bronze mirror uh, from an ancient burial ground. Um, and they, they estimated 1600 years old is discovered last January. Uh, and, you know, we also have to remember that for the most part, uh, you know, when we go back, you know, because I use uh, the Norse as an example, but the average Norse man, I think back then was like, five foot six or five foot seven, like we tended to be shorter. Um, so, and I'm telling you, you know, I'm, I'm six foot six and I couldn't wield a seven foot sword. You know, I've, I've, I've messed around with, uh, with, uh, like a, a two handed, like a Scottish sword before. And it was like unwieldy. And that was probably only about four feet long. So I can't imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, Luce was wondering about, like, don't the bones just disintegrate like dinosaur bones? Like most well, some, dinosaur bones? You know what? Some do. I would. Yeah. You know what? That's a good point. I was on an archaeological dig in 1990, 1998. And the, the season before I was there, they had uncovered skeletons that they, you know, they had to get permission from the government and all, all of this stuff. And the skeletons into containers, and they they basically crumble to dust. Oh no! So, yeah, um, I don't know. I guess that does happen. So, yeah, this yeah. really just depends on the climate, probably whether it can hold up over time or not. I mean, that's one of the problems with dinosaurs, mm -hmm. right? Is like it's not just you need the bones, but you actually need those bones bones to fossilize. So yeah. I guess, you know, mm -hmm. you get far enough back yeah. with humans, it's going to be the same way. You would need to get some fossilization occurring if you go back too far, I guess. Otherwise, it just <clears throat> crumbles. Yeah, dust to yeah. dust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, I'm, my heart's open to the whole giant <laughs> thing. <laughs> but I, I think I need more evidence. Yeah. Okay. I need yeah. more evidence because, you know, you know, there was a, I want to know what happened to the bones that got shipped to Madrid, because uh -huh. I think I, I mentioned this in the last show that I was on with you. There were people who were plowing fields for the very first time because agriculture was different. European agriculture with an ox and a plow is different from the Aztec agriculture of taking a pole and poking into the dirt and putting a seed of squash mm -hmm. or corn or whatever, or amaranth. And so these Europeans were plowing these fields for the first time and uncovering all these bones, and they all got sent back to Madrid because the king of Spain himself was interested in the whole idea of giants. And mm -hmm. where are those bones? Yeah. yeah. I want to know, you know. There's been a lot of bones that disappeared. And then we were, last time we were talking about mm -hmm. the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. and then I had forgotten about this, but you were talking about how the Smithsonian has a office in every state in the Mexico. And when the, something happens, they swoop in. And then, like, you know, what if they're finding stuff they don't want people to see? And they just, you know. Well, to clarify, it's the Mexican counterpart. Oh, okay. The counterpart. Yeah, it's the National yeah. right. It's the National Institute of Anthropology and History, which is yeah. exactly like the yeah, the Smithsonian. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have <clears throat> they have their offices there, and I think I briefly mentioned like there was once a dinosaur. They uncovered figurines at this place called the Combo, yeah. where. There, there were dinosaurs and people with dinosaurs, and you can't get a permit to dig there anymore. Yeah. And I've actually seen those those figurines. We can't Very find any more of those. Yeah. 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 Just just put it. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because you can see pieces of those figurines in walls 
of homes, like plaster walls or walls that are on the margins of property. You see some mm -hmm. of these figurines because they use the dirt. There were so many of these figurines. Oh, wow. That they use the dirt, yeah, to to make walls. Is that, you know, you look and is that like a leg of something or, you know, it's in a wall. That's wow. Been, yeah. So, yeah. That they, were, they were all over the place there and then they closed it down. But there is a museum where you can see the pieces. So, that's and it's a private museum. It has nothing to do with the government at all. Yeah. Because it was a, a German farmer who went down there and established a ranch. And then some of his people were bringing these figurines to him. And then so he started to amass a collection. And so you can go, it's the Waldemar Yulsrud Museum in Ocambro. And um, yeah, they have all of the figurines there. Wow. That, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's trippy. Because yeah. you'll see a Triceratops and you'll see <laughs> a guy on top of the Triceratops like riding him. You know, like I think I've seen that before. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that and, was from Mexico. My goodness. Yeah, and some of those figurines have been dated to around 2,000 years ago. So, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, when did we when did we discover dinosaur bones? Like in the 1800s or something? How would they how would they know? Plus, yeah, they were finding the bones, too. I mean, I guess that's possible. Yeah. But so, but to yeah, know what the whole body looks like, that's a whole different thing. Well, and then, yeah. then you get into the whole argument mm -hmm. about dragons in general, like dragons existed in pretty much every culture. Yeah. And so to have that shared idea of these large lizards existing, you know, was that dragons or were that? Were the, the bones that they were finding or yeah. was it dinosaurs that existed? I, I don't know if we'll ever know, but. Um, well, you know what? Someone yeah. said to me in the comments section that you, th the whole prevalence of dragons comes from drug trips. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and one thing when the Spanish first went to Mexico, they one of the things that they noticed some of these priests were like, you know, because there was so much drug use, peyote, you know, <laughs> yeah. things like that. It's like these people well, are high, they're doing hallucinate, they're on yeah. mushrooms and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And someone in a comment section said, yeah, I've seen Quetzalcoatl. I've seen the feathered serpent on a mushroom trip. And he was saying it's part of our archetypes and you know, you can access this this big record and anyone can do it throughout the world. And that's why there is a prevalence of dragons. So I don't know. That's someone's opinion. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, who knows? Well, that can lead you down a whole nother path, because on one hand, I think, especially for someone who. Is an experience with that, I think one of the things that jumps to mind is, well, the person was under the influence of a narcotic, so they saw something that isn't real. But then there's also the mindset of <laughs> this person was under the influence of a narcotic and it opened them up to see what is real. <laughs> yeah. So even that isn't necessarily an explanation, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, is getting a lot of uh, uh, publicity lately with like ayahuasca and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, becoming kind of yeah, brought into true. I know Aaron Rodgers, the NFL quarterback, has brought a lot of media to going down and uh, for ayahuasca and stuff like that, that people are that, that are doing that. So who knows? Uh, it's it's an interesting it's interesting to think about in general. Um, the dragon thing. Yeah, it's that that's weird, though, that having and then once again, if it's not real, then why are people having shared experiences? Yep. <laughs> why are we seeing the same things, you know? I don't know. I don't know. And some of the some of the accessing of alternate consciousness down in Mexico didn't require the use of any sort of substances. There were back to the Seri, those people with the giant story that we talked about earlier. They believed that they could draw circles on a rock 
And after a period of fasting and wandering in the desert, you sit down in front of a rock and you draw the circles and you look at the circles and that opens up a portal mm. where things can come in and you can go into the portal. So That's pretty cool. Yeah. And that doesn't require any sort of chemicals or substances or anything. Yeah. It's just your own, you know, meditation and your preparing for this state to to get into this state mm -hmm. so yeah but like i yeah. said the spanish were mm -hmm. appalled you know <laughs> we've got to put we got to put a stop to all of this yeah mm -hmm. so, <laughs> don't get your did. panties in a bunch jose it's all right <laughs> <laughs> oh man so there was another very interesting podcast that you put it. It's a, it's an old one. So if you don't remember everything about it, it's OK. Um, but right. it was the Chinese connection to Mexico and the weird stuff I found that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, that's another claim to the old Mex. I mm -hmm. think we mentioned that before, that every mm -hmm. culture wants to claim them. Yeah. <laughs> and there was supposedly a big Chinese fleet that went and visited this part of Mexico. And there, some of the evidence for that, you can look at some of the figurines that are coming out of that area at the time, and they look very Asiatic. Mm -hmm. And the style, the working with jade, you know, mm -hmm. that is very Chinese. And yeah, so uh, people think there is a connection with the Gulf Coast, and then also off of the coast of Baja, California, and I believe off the coast of Southern California, too, there have been anchors that have been found mm -hmm. that date yeah. back 2,000 years, circular anchors. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I had an anthropology professor, uh, George Cogill. He's in a lot of the literature of One thing he said to us in class at ASU, Arizona State University, was don't ever underestimate the ability of these people to get around. So, you know, I believe there could have been long distance contact. Mm -hmm. It may have been a lot less difficult than we think, especially yeah. if you're skirting around the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't know. So, yeah, get on one of them currents. Yeah. Get on the I'm current. Sorry. Come on over the currents. <laughs> well, I think that's interesting too because you look at times of like many ice ages where the sea levels were lower, mm -hmm. uh, creates more land and it creates a better opportunity if someone was, you know, were, were navigating the seas. It gives them more stopping points to be able to kind of reload on water and food and stuff like that. They think that's how the, uh, the Norse were able to get to North America uh, because of, of the ice age that was happening. So, yeah, it brings up some interesting questions. It, so one of them uh, is one thing that I had heard of before, which is the this uh, uh, the Mayan blue. Are you familiar with that? I, I imagine the Mayan blue, and and yeah, it's a, a certain pigment that they use in their paintings and stuff. Yeah, and and I was watching a documentary or, or some kind of program. It's been so long now, I can't remember. But they were talking about how they found it in Florida. Um, so which to me uh, is just. Uh, uh, a signification that there was trade. <laughs> uh, oh, go well, figure. You know, trade with each other, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I did a show called Did the Maya Colonize Florida? Oh, because okay. on the Florida Keys, the Florida Keys, and then also outside of Tampa, there is evidence that a case could be made that the Maya were there, some structures that a, lo a lot of it's been trashed you know, over time and stuff. But there is a case that could be made of a connection between Florida and Georgia. I yes. mean, I've looked into this and I've been gathering more information for a show about Georgia, but I've done the show on Florida. And yeah, there's also a parrot that only exists in the Yucatan that the Maya had domesticated, that they had kept, that also can be found in Southern Florida, but oh, not wow. in Cuba and, you know, not in the other islands. So there, it wouldn't be a stretch, 
really, no. because no. You go, you, if you pull out a map, mm-hmm. it's pretty close. You know, these areas yeah. are close. They could have either skipped across the Gulf of Mexico there, mm-hmm. or they could have just easily went around went around yep. the Gulf. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's possible. And, you know, one of the things, you know, when we talk about the Olmec, I think right now, you know, if I had to take a guess just from the evidence I've heard is that is that the Olmec were just the Olmec and there's that there's a bit of of issues with colonization and stuff that I think lead people to want to say there had to be somebody that came from somewhere else there. But, you know, when you really look at it, you know, one of those things that we find out in history is that human beings aren't any more intelligent than they were thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Humans have, have always had the same intelligence. And and once you understand that, I think it's hard. It's hard for me then to believe that there wasn't much more travel going on than, than the historians would have us believe because it's just like that human drive, isn't it? To like know what's out there and to be pushing boundaries. And so Mm -hmm. I don't find it to be strange at all that, the same people who were who were uh, going to Hawaii and the Pacific Islands and stuff just happened to stop there and never made it uh, over to South or, or or North America. Yeah, you know, like I said, never underestimate the ability of these people to get around. Yeah, I think you know, and you made a really good point because even though you might have some old curmudgeons who want to stay at home or whatever. Every human civilization has had explorers, people who want to just go out mm-hmm. and and explore, you know. And so, yeah, I don't think that it's so far fetched, especially if you have the technology. I the, the Maya could possibly have gone. I think they had the technology. They had the, the boats. The it, It's not far. It's not like yeah. going to yeah. Africa from the Japan. Mm-hmm. If you look at a map, like I said, it's not too far fetched. No. Yeah. Especially with the knowledge of the skies that they had. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. they, they don't have Google Maps, but they got they got <laughs> they got a pretty good navigation system and almost yeah. all ancient that almost all the ancient peoples had. Like, you know, we I go outside now, I'm like, oh, there's Orion's belt. And you know, my knowledge is pretty pretty poor c- considering, but for most people back then, I mean, that just would have been something that they did every night. You know, uh, uh, the knowledge of the sky and what it should look like and the correlations mm-hmm. there. So I don't know. We'll see. I, mean, I think they're going to find more about that. I definitely think. And mm-hmm. the problem with that is, is to find the evidence of that travel mm-hmm. is probably on the bottom of the ocean. Like you said, that the round anchors they found. I remember hearing about that. So how do you find, you know, more evidence about that when, you know, wood boats are not going to be around anymore and so on yeah. and so forth. All right. So. We talked about the Olmec again. That's good. <laughs> that, 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 that's a hot They topic. always come up every show I do. Yeah. It seems like they always come up every they're, show. They're yeah. so interesting and such a mystery. Everybody just wants to know. We just want to know. What's the yeah. deal? Well, what is the popular yeah. consensus uh, that they have on that? That the Olmec uh, basically empire went down and then eventually it rose back into the Aztec empire? Or was it a completely different thing eventually was it a different people group what's the consensus do you know well it's a continuity theory for mesoamerica you know the olmecs they invented the calendar they invented a lot of different things they started to invent a writing system they went down then the maya and the sapotex ascended and they took some of that um, knowledge and then the big kids on the block after that were the Toltecs, mostly in central Mexico. They had some influence in the Yucatan, too. Then they collapsed. Then the Aztecs were the big boys on the block. And they incorporated things, remnants from the other civilizations. So there is there is a continuity in things like the calendar. You can trace it all the way back from Olmec times to the conquest. So, yeah, civilizations rise and fall, you know, just like in the West, the Roman mm-hmm. civilization fell. But yet our capital building in the United States, close to you guys, right? Yeah. Um, the, this, the U.S. Capitol looks Roman because mm-hmm. it's neoclassical, right? Yeah. So we have that same sort of thread going through Western society, too. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so that's, and it, it all started with the ep, the Olmec or the Epi Olmec. You know, the the they they had to solve problems, just like in the the Middle East, the Near East, where you had to solve water problems. Then you had to get some sort of an organization going. You had to have people overseeing the the irrigation and then sedentary is, you know, the sedentary lifestyle happened with farming and raising domesticated animals and things got more complex with craft specialization and that. Then it just, you know, it just bloomed into a civilization. So it started with trying to organize to solve problems. And in the case of the Olmec, it was water issues. And then the Maya, too. The Maya, the, the northern part of the Yucatan, there is no surface water. There are no rivers. And so I think you had self-selecting intelligence going on. The Maya, to me, were the most intelligent people. That of all of these civilizations, if you want to look at it in aggregate, but they were, they had to deal with the most complex problems with regard to water and the environment. Mm -hmm. And so I think the smartest people survived and then they developed this complex civilization where they had leisure time, where they could go into complex mathematics and astronomy. I mean, this, I know your show is evergreen, evergreen, but we had that eclipse a little while back here. Mm-hmm. And the Maya eclipse tables predicted an eclipse would pass through, you know, total darkness would pass through the Maya area on July 7th, 1991. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a thousand years, basically, yeah. after the collapse. And they were 100 percent accurate in predicting that. So, yeah, they were just amazing. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It really is. All yeah. right. I want to change uh, pace a little bit. Last time you shared the story uh, with this of the Mexican Roswell, and I saw a video went up on Mexico and explained uh, not that long ago about some other UFO sightings that had taken place in Mexico. I didn't know if that was the same or if there were some other famous UFO uh, encounters you could tell us about. Yeah, there's all there are a lot to talk about. But, you know, I was really curious when you were talking at the beginning in your news about underwater UFOs. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, during that time, I guess the guest is supposed to be silent. Right. But you can always feel free to talk. Yeah. You could have jumped in. Let's talk about it right now. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, great. Well, there are two really interesting Mm -hmm. incidents in Mexico for these underwater UFOs. In fact, on either coast, there is supposed to be, well, people believe that there are underwater bases. Now, Mm -hmm. one is in the Gulf of California, which is also called the Sea of Cortez, and that's an arm of the Pacific, for people not familiar with the geography. That's an arm of the Pacific that separates Baja California, the peninsula, from the what they call the mainland of Mexico. So you have this big, huge gulf, this narrow inlet that goes up. And there's supposedly right in the middle of that gulf, there is supposed to be an alien base. And even as far as Tijuana, they've seen these you know, UFOs that have come out Mm -hmm. of this underwater base. So that's an interesting thing to look at. And they've they've looked at uh, there's that sensing technology where you can take away all the water. I mean, I know that's Mm -hmm. kind of a basic way of saying it, where you can map the floor Mm -hmm. and on the in the middle of the Gulf of California, in the middle of the Sea of Cortez, there is this structure it, mm. it looks like this 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 uh, rectangular structure that doesn't look natural. And people are saying that's the base. Mm. OK, so that's that side of Mexico. On the other side of the of the country on the Gulf Coast, there are a few little towns that have an annual Fiesta de los Marcianos, the festival Fiesta of the Martians. Mm. And like 
a religious festival where they parade the Virgin Mary around or their local saint. They take the saint out from the altar of the local church and then they parade it around and then they have a fiesta for a week. Well, they do the same thing for the Martians. Wow. Because they and they have this big paper mache green, usually green looking um, image of a, or, a, you know, a, what do you call it? Uh, it's like it's paper mache. It's mm -hmm. a it's a sculpture of a gray, you know, yeah. a classic gray, you know, usually painted green because mm -hmm. Martians are green. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they parade it around the they parade it around the towns. Now, why do they do that? Because. Some people in the 60s believed that this base that's off the coast in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is the eastern side of the country. Some people believe that that Martian base, that alien base that's underwater, saved those coastal towns from a hurricane. Oh, wow. And ever since that time in the 60s, mm -hmm. there hasn't been a hurricane that has hit that part of the gulf uh -huh. which is kind of strange uh -huh. and so just like just like they do with the religious festivals like i said they'll parade the 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 saint or the virgin the local um religious icon they parade it around to give thanks to it they do the same with the martian wow because they want to give thanks to these aliens these extraterrestrials who are operating that base because they believe that they have diverted all of the hurricanes because the hurricanes would mess up their mm -hmm. little underwater thing there. So, yeah. Yeah. So they have an annual fiesta. That sounds so awesome. Yeah. It's just like a religious fiesta. So Hoaxers <laughs> was saying, Hoaxers was saying we needed a field trip to the dinosaur figurine museum. I think we also <laughs> need to field trip to the Martian uh, fiesta. <laughs> Well, you know what? You're saying field trips. I'm thinking of resuscitating my tours business yeah. <laughs> and seeing, you know, now that I have more people following me on YouTube and all of mm -hmm. this stuff and TikTok. Now, TikTok's crazy. I mean, yeah, <laughs> some of my shorts have gotten hundreds of thousands of views. Wow. wow. Congratulations. You know, so thank you. Um, so I'm thinking maybe I might want to test the waters again. And yeah come up with some tours to take people mm -hmm. down because you know yeah. i could do a religious tour i could do an aliens tour i could mm -hmm. do you know a paranormal i could do paranormal ghost tours yeah of different places you know and so i don't know we'll see. sign me up i'll make yeah. sure i keep my little dog <laughs> my little dog in the purse at home okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't that's have something, a little dog in a purse. <laughs> that's something we've we were just talking about. I think the like last week we were talking about with the witching hours. Eventually, we would like to be able to have uh, listeners, you know, part of the community, get together and go on some small trips. So if we get to that, we'll 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 uh, keep in touch and because uh, yeah, we yeah. got a friend who can know their way around down there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I know about is Mexico. That's for sure because I've traveled. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah, it's been quite an adventure, but uh, yeah, there's there's so much to see. There's still so much for even me for for mm -hmm. me to discover down there. So is there I'm any, always uncovering new things. Is there any place or places that you actually haven't been to yet that you still want to explore? There's always there are always different places. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I. <sighs> Yeah, there are. Yeah, because <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't even know my own country, though. I yeah. haven't been to places like I haven't been. I mean, California, I've never been to the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, I've never been to like the That's northern. Because you're Plains always in Mexico. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I've I don't even know my own country that well. And there are parts of Mexico that I still need to go to. Yeah. Some smaller towns and stuff like that. But yeah, it's one of those Always things like more. I, I, uh, I used to live in, in Texas for a while. I was stationed there in the military. And when we went there, I was like, all right, like I'm going to get to New Mexico. I'm going to get to Arizona. I'm going to go see the desert. I want to go see these places I haven't seen before. But instead, whenever I took leave, I went back home to the East yeah. Coast, you know? So it's like, <laughs> 
I was out in Texas and I did some Texas stuff, but I never got out yeah. further west. And so it's like one of those things where for sure, like our own, our own, our own backyard sometimes is, uh, is, uh, is unexplored. So mm-hmm. there's definitely some, some cool things we could do. That, that would be fun to get some communities of, of people who were, uh, interested in the things we're interested in and, and to go check some things yeah. out for sure. Cause there's all kinds of places that you can go all kinds of places. And you know, we could design a custom tour if you wanted just ghosts, geez, that could, t- <laughs> that could be two weeks, you know, yeah. two weeks of going to different cities and it's just that, but mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway. So yeah, keep that in mind. That could be yeah. something really, really cool to do. That would be excellent. Well, we uh, just to kind of update everybody, uh, we're already past the nine o'clock hour. uh, So we are headed on uh, well into the show. Once again, uh, if you have a question for Robert, please put it uh, in chat. You can use the channel points, the uh, element uh, 115 down there to uh, uh, to go ahead and uh, highlight your message if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, So we don't miss it in chat. But uh, if you just have a comment or uh, something uh, that you are curious about. If you have a specific question, feel free to throw that in there and we'll uh, relay that to the guest. Uh, so feel free to put that in there. Uh, and if you're just joining us, we're here with Robert Pitto and we're talking about, well, all kinds of things, uh, but Mexico <laughs> Unexplained, all the kinds of mysteries and and things that have uh, come out of Mexico, uh, talking about the paranormal, weird and supernatural as we typically do. And thank you everyone uh, who's hanging out with us tonight. Uh, and I wanted to uh, thank uh, Hoaxers and Journey of Self-Discovery for the for the subs. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, yes. thank you for all the people who are listening to us on the podcast. If you can, it would always be wonderful if you could uh, go and hit that subscribe button and like and all that kind of stuff. So more people uh, uh, can find us and listen to these programs. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any of those places, uh, leave us a little review there so that we can uh, we can keep this thing going for a long time. But anyway, so we can get these to trips us. to Mexico. Yeah, we'll planned. do some trips. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the YouTube for Mexico Unexplained and Robert's book. Uh, Robert's website are pinned up at the top. So you can check out those links and they will also be in the description of the podcast. Should you be listening to it later? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really love interacting with people. So um, sometimes I get some of the best story ideas from from listeners and viewers. Mm -hmm. Uh, The border tends to be a very fluid place and it always has been and nothing nothing too political about that. But there there are people who, you know, have relatives down there. Let's say you're a little kid, you're born in L.A., but your grandma's in a small town in Oaxaca. You spend three months out of the year down there with her. And there's a creature that lurks in the forest near her house or whatever. I want to hear stories like that. And yeah. I've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of stories that are along those lines. And those are fascinating for me to look into and to research. And I want to bring these things out to the English speaking world, the broader world, so that we can all have a better understanding for not only Mexico, but of ourselves, of you know, humanity, the more we we stitch these things together, the the more complete of a picture I think we have of ourselves as people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Everybody's different stories and experiences. And then, like, you know, when somebody feels like they've had an experience that is so completely bizarre that it can't possibly Nobody else can possibly have this experience, but then they finally share it. And lo and behold, they're not the only one that has had some yeah. kind of experience like that. It does bring everybody together. And I yeah. think there's a like a deep, res, like a deep recognition on a human level that like no matter where these stories come from, it's a shared experience. Like it's we're all human beings that are so like. You know, no, what, no matter what content is happening on, it's happening to us as, as human beings. And I, so it's like, it, it's related to all of us, no matter where this information is coming from. Right. 
to a certain yeah. extent. That's the way I feel about it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question here from Lunar Paloma. Uh, Lunar Paloma. Is Robert aware of the story about the whales that bring their babies to small boats for humans to touch them? There was a story about a fisherman who befriended a whale. Oh, have you ever heard of that before? No. I, I wonder where that's happening. It must be the Pacific Coast, probably, right? Yeah. Yeah, do you know where, uh, let, let us know in, in chat, Lunar Paloma, oh, if you know where that's yeah. specific, yeah. Hmm. See, this is what I'm talking about. I don't yeah. know everything. <laughs> I like to hear things, you know. <laughs> well, Lunar knows a lot of stuff about animals. She's got some crazy animal stories. Great. A sea that's... of Cortez, she said. Oh, Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where that base is located. Yeah. We talk about. Okay. And there's yeah. also a, there's also a legend there about the black demon shark, the demonio negro. And they think that it's a real cryptid, that it's a megalodon. Oh, that wow. There's a holdover population of megalodon sharks that are in that gulf. Yeah. So. Wow. And they they made a cheesy movie about it last year <laughs> that I went to see. It was in the theaters. I'm a big movie goer. I love going to the movies. I love going to the concession stand and getting popcorn and all that stuff. It's, it's like my, the only treat I have to myself because I work so much all the time. Yeah. So I went to this movie and I was all gung-ho, right? They're doing this legend. And it was like Hollywood. Garbage. Yeah. yeah. For all of these messages that they inserted in there and, you know, it was like, oh, come on, what is this? And it was only in the theaters for two weeks. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But anyway, that's a, that's a legend. Yeah. Well, that's another news story you could have talked about with us today because we were talking about uh, Steven Spielberg and getting some more alien movies coming up. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway. Uh. To take a step back real quick, we were talking about the, the, the submersible UFOs. I just wanted to, you know, kind of talk about that because I think I have seen stories before about those coming out of lakes too in Mexico, like a big, uh, you know, like constantly seeing submersibles and I kind of going back in time, uh, there are, uh, journey of self-discovery is completely going crazy with <laughs> right now. So thank you so much. Journey, we appreciate it. You appreciate it so much. Thank Yay. you. Um, and, and some people think that there have actually been more probably submersible sightings than there have been UFO sightings, that these are actually more common than mm. seeing uh, UFOs going into the water than other sightings. And um, a lot of military officials, uh, uh, sailors, Navy sailors, uh, lots and lots of reports of UFOs going under the water. Uh, uh, the lakes, uh, uh, the Great Lakes, and then of course, you know, mm -hmm. the, the lakes uh, down in Mexico and Central America and stuff like that. So, something to keep an yeah, eye on. I'm there, yeah, there are some uh, some instances of that too in Mexico about lakes. And I went to on one bike trip. I took a little side trip to this area called the Siete Luminarias, the Seven Luminaries. And there are these seven lakes that have mysterious properties mm. you know, to them. And one of them supposedly is connected to the ocean, even though that it's way inland. But, um, yeah, I went there. There are all of these paranormal things going on there. Um, and one thing was that UFOs were coming out of one of the lakes. Mm. And around the lakes... Just briefly, some of the paranormal stuff around the lakes, they grow gigantic vegetables. And that was happening in the 60s and 70s. And then investigators went down there and then all of a sudden it stopped. It hmm. they yeah, it that doesn't happen anymore. You Weird. see photographs and I talked to people like older people about that. And um yeah, they were like, we don't do that anymore. We're not supposed to grow these. And I was like, huh, the one wanted to talk about it. Mm. And then in one of the in one of these crater lakes, it was really interesting because I had heard that Yuri Geller visited this place with the first lady of Mexico at the time. Mm. And they mm. did some sort of, you know, 
I, I don't know if it was like a seance, something along those lines to try to connect with the spirits that were there. And when I went there, I was hoping that I was going to run into, and there was a woman from Australia who is a medium who said to me, please try to contact or please open yourself up to contacting this trapped indigenous woman, the spirit, because this Australian lady had had heard about it. And I'm like, oh, really? That's connected with these lakes? I didn't know. So there's a story of people who hike around in that area. They see this woman who is part apparition. Sometimes she's a fully formed person and she's in distress and she's mm. using a language. She's using a language that no one knows, not even the oh. indigenous people in the area. Mm. And it's like, she's tr sometimes she's floating. Sometimes she's walking and it kind of, the stories remind me of that Star Trek episode where Captain Kirk was beamed into another was beamed out and then Uhura saw him in the hallway and he was in the space. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're Star Trek fans or whatever, yeah. but I don't know if you remember that episode, but he was I caught can in picture, a space. I can dimension. picture William Shatner. <laughs> yeah, he was in the space suit and then Uhura freaked out and started to call Spock. Spock, I saw the captain. And then they medicated her. They took her to sick bay, but she really saw the captain. <laughs> but, so I was getting impressions that this this legend was similar to that because some people see her as a physical person, then some people see her like floating and she's trapped and she doesn't know where she is. Mm. And this Australian woman was saying. If you can, please try to help her. And I, you know, I have no idea how this woman in Australia knew about this story. Yeah. But she said she felt like going to that lake and doing something to try to release the spirit. Because, Ooh. yeah, it's a pleading woman, like she's lost and needs help and doesn't know where she is. Wow. But it's like she's trapped. And this. This sighting has happened for years and years and years, and it's they're always describing describing the same person. So I don't know. I didn't see her, though. And if she's speaking but, a language that nobody even knows anymore, she's been stuck there for a long time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I I didn't see her. I couldn't do anything. My heart was open, though. <laughs> I, was open to I was open to it, yeah. but she wasn't there. And I. Yeah. There was a kid there. I paid him like 15 pesos or whatever to talk to me more about it. You know, he was like mm -hmm. an informal guy because this place is like way out and there was nothing there. Yeah. Right. And he was telling me, he says, oh, yeah, we've we've heard about her. I haven't seen her myself, but people have seen this Indita, this little Indian woman who's in distress. That's mm -hmm. what he said. She's in distress and she doesn't know where she is. Wow. Yeah, it's a touching story, actually, you know, yeah, if it mm -hmm. is true, you know, yeah. if it is a track spirit who's been there for thousands of years, let's do yeah. something and release yeah. it. Yeah, poor lady. Yeah, but that those seven lakes to tie it all up that UFOs have been seen coming out of, of those lakes and those lakes too supposedly line up to a some sort of star constellation. Mm -hmm. So you got the giant yeah. vegetable lake, the alien lake, and the trapped ghost lady lake. Yeah. But they're you said they were created by uh like like they're craters that turned yeah, into so, lakes. Yeah, mm. they were filled up with water. And some of them are just some of them are really dried out now. Yeah. And I think most of them don't have a lot of water in them. Mm. But um, yeah. So I, I I remember I went there. It was so hot, and <laughs> the, the rocks are white, and they're reflecting the sun. Uh, and I'm, yeah. Oh my gosh, this is just. Oof. And it was like I said, off the beaten track. But I had heard about it, so I decided to go there on one of my buying trips. That's one thing now, you know, that I'm really into Mexico unexplained. I can tie in a buying trip with a little bit of investigation. Yeah. So awesome. Mm -hmm. Which uh, we did have another question. And I remember you mentioning this last time, but we didn't actually talk about it. 
Um, there's a, a Mexican Loch Ness monster, is there not? Yes, called the Awisot. And in fact, one of the most powerful Aztec emperors took the name Awisot. And he's his glyph, his his um, pictogram has the creature over his head. And so this creature is a big lake monster that supposedly lived in the central lakes of the highlands of Mexico, specifically Lake Texcoco. Lake Texcoco doesn't exist anymore. Well, parts mm. of it do. It's, it's weird because the Aztec legend, the Aztecs were a wandering people until they were, they were supposed to settle down when they saw an eagle eating a snake on top of a cactus, which we oh, see in the yeah. central, the central part of Mexico's flag. It's the Escudo. It's the national coat of arms. So they settled in this island in the middle of the lake where they saw this, the prophecy come true. Mm -hmm. And so they built their city on this island. The Spanish came and, of course, conquered the Aztec Empire and then built Mexico City there. And so they had to eventually drain this lake. So the habitat of the Awisut, you know, disappeared. So the animal went extinct, supposedly. And what it is, mm. some people think that it's a, a prehistoric river otter, part of a holdover megafauna, mm -hmm. this gigantic creature with a prehensile tail. Part of the legend is that the creature will, if you're taking a boat on the lake, will take its tail and swoop it over your boat, capsize your boat, and then take you down to its cave in the lake and then, you know, kill you or whatever. And so that's the legend of the Awisut. And like I said, some cryptozoologists believe that it was an actual animal, a holdover from megafauna, wow. you know, this gigantic river otter. But, um, mm. yeah, we don't know. There were some some Spanish colonial sightings of this creature, too. So after the conquest of the Aztecs, for maybe about 100 years or so, people were still seeing the creature. But like I said, they eventually drained the lake. Southern part of Lake Texcoco is still there. That's where you have the floating gardens, the Chinampas of Xochimilco. Um, people know of that, you know, if you've ever done the tourist thing in Mexico City. But um, for the most part, the lake is completely drained. And mm. that's not a good place to build a huge city. I mean, there are like 25 million people living there on a mm -hmm. dead lake, an <laughs> unstable lake bed where there's a fault line. There's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then two big volcanoes that mm. are constantly erupting, you know. When I was down there in 1995, when I was leaving, when they were transferring me to Brazil, the, the Popocatépetl, they call it Popo for short, but Popocatépetl was becoming alive again. Oh and it was like, holy crap, I've never lived in a place where the volcano was erupting. <laughs> <laughs> People were saying, ah, pff, you're not going to, it's no big deal. Yeah. Is there? It's always huffing and puffing, you know. Mm -hmm. and, sure, they said that at Pompeii, uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, no big deal. Yeah. Uh, whatever. And yeah. it goes back to Aztec times, too, because people think that that was a warrior and right next to that volcano is an extinct volcano called Ista Siwat. And Ista Siwat has permanent snow field. We talked about, a little bit about that mm -hmm. when we talked about the Quatlacus, the Bigfoot creature last time. Yeah. But Ista Siwat is a sleeping princess. It's mm -hmm. the white lady. That's what it means in, in the Aztec language. So you have this smoking volcano and right next to it is the extinct volcano that's white. And he's carrying a torch for oh. the, the dead princess that he yeah. didn't come back in time to to marry, you know, because he was off fighting. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the story of that's the kinda, volcanoes. That's kind of cute, though. Yeah, yeah, I was also thinking love, a, eternal love story. 
I was also yeah. thinking a giant river otter would be kind of cute too. So I'm wondering why it was so scary. Why are capsizing your boat? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was Dragging like, oh, a giant river the... otter. We can go swimming with it. Down to a watery <laughs> grave. Yeah. <laughs> Until he takes you to his cave. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go hang out with the river otter. Yeah. Yeah. So people think that that is, it could be a holdover from the Ice Age, right? Yeah. Just mm -hmm. like there's a mysterious large cat that they think is a holdover of the North American cheetah that mm. still exists in Mexico. Yeah. Wow. So um, that's been cited a lot. Mm. And they even shot one and, and took a carcass of it. And it ended up in a Texas. A university, a Texas university museum was was examining it, and then guess what? It just disappeared. disappeared. <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> I, I should have let you complete that. Guess what? Yeah, I should have let you answer that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah it disappeared. We know that story. It's Damn always, you, Smithsonian. Always yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there have been sightings of that, and in fact, when I did a show on that, um, I had people chime in in the comment section saying yeah my uncle lived in a small town high in the mountains and he shot one mm -hmm. and um skinned it and stuff and yeah so there could wow. be some holdovers from of these creatures yeah and they could actually be real and not part of legend so yeah i believe it yeah my I mean, heart is know. open to the ancient creatures that are still existing. We don't know about the key. I mean, they're always finding new stuff, you know, like I just saw some article the other day where it's like, I don't remember exactly what place in the in the world they were at, but it was they had found like hundreds of new ocean creatures they had never discovered before. And I'm like, good Lord, you know, mm -hmm. like what else do we not know about? <laughs> Well, you know what? To tie it into ancient Mexico, the Maya civilization, um, people are making new discoveries by the week. It's an mm -hmm. exciting um, archaeology uh, discipline because they're, they're constantly deciphering things. They're finding things. The Maya civilization left behind a lot of stuff, and a lot of it has been inaccessible. They're yeah. building a huge train that's going through the Maya area, the Maya train, and just putting down the tracks. They're finding all of this stuff, they're finding too much stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. And the, the, another another connected story with that Maya train, the president of Mexico was inaugurating a section of that train. And I don't know if you heard about this before. I don't know if we brought this up last time, but. He saw, supposedly saw an Alush, a little person from oh. Maya mythology. He supposedly saw one in a tree and they took a picture of it. They tried to, but he went public with it. And that was amazing. Actually, that was wow. an amazing story because this was oh, the head. It was of, the little guy that we that we colored, right? That's right. That's yes, this guy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He saw one supposedly in a tree and came out nationally oh. and said that it made it made headlines. Wow. Because, you know, think about it. 20, 30 years ago, you'd be considered crazy. Yeah. Especially if you were a politician, if you were someone in the public eye like that. But mm -hmm. he was like, yeah, I saw an illusion. It was in the tree. We tried to take pictures of it. And I think wow. there are some pictures out there, some blurry things. You see these two eyes up in the tree or whatever. But, um, yeah, he was claiming that he actually saw an illusion. Actually, during this, uh, inaugurating this train. Wow. Yeah, I just found I found the story and I posted it there in chat. So if anyone wants to go check those <laughs> pictures wow. in there. So wow. go check it out. You scroll down yeah. just like one little scroll down in the picture there of the Alush in the uh in the tree. Oh there. my god, that's terrifying looking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why you're supposed to be nice to them. Oh, you know, yeah. you're supposed to leave them things. Leave him a little tequila, leave him some tortillas. You know. Who doesn't like tequila and tortillas? I mean, really, come on now. 
Or he'll wow. really mess you up. He'll mess yeah. up your event. He'll take your bridge down, whatever. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so, we're always down for margaritas and tacos over here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, we'll hang out with the river otter and the Aloosh. We'll bring the tequila. There we go. <laughs> So I don't know if we talked about this last time or not, but we have another kind of version of this program that I've been lazy with, uh, the Witching Hour Stories, where I kind of do a deep dive on different things. We've done, um, we've done, you know, like maybe a specific UFO event or a, a, a figure who's connected with time travel or something like that. And the, the, we had a community vote on what we should do next, and that was uh, the Skinwalkers. Uh, which I know are is something that you know from the American West and the American Southwest. Is there a connection between those mythologies in North America? Are there any connections to that in Central or South America? Sure, we have um, a couple of shape shifting creatures. One of them is the Nagual, and the Nagual that's been kind of twisted. Carlos Castaneda did some fiction books about Toltec sorcery and Toltec, Toltec religion that some people think is based on fact, but it's it's all fiction. He talks about a Nawal being a different thing, like an alter ego of a person, you know, something that's inside you tapping your inner Nawal. But a Nawal traditionally, for thousands of years, this creature, you can see it depicted in artwork going back 2,000 years at least. And what it is, it's a sorcerer, a shaman, a medicine man, whatever term you want to use. I know some people are very picky about the terms, mm -hmm. but oh, gosh, <laughs> you're a wizard. <laughs> OK, so it's somebody who has the knowledge to do so. They change yeah. themselves into this snarling feline dog like creature. Okay, don't all get excited about dog man. You know, I know that's a big <laughs> thing that people talk about all the time. It's a cat dog battling man. dog man, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's it, right, exactly. It's a feline dog man. It's mm. a combination of the two. And then so the Nawal goes out and does things and then shape shifts back. Mm. And okay, so that's a shape shifting type creature. There's also another one. I don't think we talked about the Tlawil Pucci in the last show. I don't a shape-shifting so. witch. I think okay. I would remember that, that word. Okay. Tlawo yeah. Pucci, shape-shifting witch. We did touch a little bit about, uh, touch on a, a little bit about witches, I we think. Did, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, in Mexico, it's always the same thing. It's a woman who is marginalized and lives on the edge. Ah, okay. There she is. Yeah. I was, what, not to interrupt you, but there's quite a few creatures in this coloring book that have chicken feet. What is up with right. the chicken feet? That's a, you know what? That's a whole other story. <laughs> that, yeah. The chicken feet thing goes into the 21st century, too. So there are stories, there's always a story about, well, not into the 21st century, I'd say late 20th century. There's mm -hmm. always someone who is Mexican-American, always in their family. There's a story about their grandma or their great aunt who goes to a dance and dances with a handsome guy and looks down and there's chicken feet <laughs> on the guy. That, that's a story that you the hear everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. This handsome guy, chicken feet or one chicken foot and a hoof of a goat. And then it's really the devil, you know, and it's always my grandma went to a dance and that's when it happened. And, the, you know, this handsome, it's always the most handsome guy you've ever seen whenever walking into the place and then wow. goes up to the pretty girl and then they're dancing and then she looks down, there's chicken feet. So the chicken feet thing goes Damn back chicken feet. <laughs> thousands of years, but it, chicken or turkey. Well, okay. because the turkey is so originally turkey. Now chicken. So, mm -hmm. okay, the Tlawal Puji, we'll go back to that with the yes. chicken feet, right? Yes. <laughs> so this is a witch. And I was thinking about this when I was on another interview that the witch stories in Mexico, 
it's always it always starts with a marginalized woman who Mm -hmm. maybe she's smarter than everyone else. Maybe she's more sensitive. Maybe she she's different Mm -hmm. and she's unique, but she's scorned and she's they don't like her. They make fun of her and all of this stuff. And then Mm -hmm. she ends up moving out to the edge of the village and then starts dabbling in the dark arts or whatever. And that's how these witches come about. It's seems like it's everywhere. And I'm wondering if that's like, I wonder if that's a kind of like a way of getting young girls to conform. Oh, yeah. Because you don't want to be like that marginalized Mm -hmm. woman, the weird woman who lives in the Afueras, who's, you know, on the edge of the village or whatever. You don't want to be the 50 year old cat lady who never got married. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's our that, yeah, that is, <laughs> that's our equivalent, I guess, the cat yeah. lady, right? Mm-hmm. Who hoards stuff and lives yeah. alone or whatever. Right. That's the yeah, exactly. Still, Even which, is still the like connection, which is probably still connection mm-hmm. with witches. Because the witches could, had yeah. the witches had the familiar, which was often the cat. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. They were also, even in the Salem witch trials. A lot of the women who were first accused were ones who were lived on like the, out, the edge of town that were the ones that were thought to be a little bit eccentric. Uh, we had a witch in Virginia, the Pongo witch uh, down in Virginia Beach, who was kind of the same thing, a little bit off <laughs> on her own, and she was accused of being a witch. So I think that is uh, traverses uh, culture, it sounds mm-hmm. like there. Can we just accept people for who they are? I mean, you know, it's like... Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're a little bit weird okay you don't have to live <laughs> at the edge of town we're all that way i think deep down all of us can identify with the, oh yeah you know, some of us more than about. others yeah <laughs> <laughs> so anyway okay back to the tlawal it's a very interesting story because this never would have gotten any sort of attention out of the rural areas of Tlaxcala. Tlaxcala is a tiny little state in central Mexico. It's like they're Rhode Island, okay? Mm -hmm. So there was a a young functionary, a young government employee who was in the capital city of Tlaxcala, Tlaxcala City, and he was processing death records, okay? He was processing death certificates, and he was noticing that... um, for cause of death, people were writing down chupado por la bruja, which meant sucked by a witch. That was the cause of death. And so this young and up and coming government worker went to his boss and said, look, I'm seeing in these tiny little towns that have population 200, 500, whatever, they're listing cause of death as chupado por la bruja. What is this all about? And then The boss said, well, maybe we should look into this. So then they sent people from the capital city to these rural areas and found out that in these little towns, they had this belief that once again, the whole marginalized woman, whatever, the witch would be able to shape shift into whatever animal, let's say a fly to start out with. She could shapeshift into a fly, go into the keyhole of the door or crack in the window, and then fly over the baby, the crib, and then appear into, you know, a woman. Mm -hmm. And then go and suck the baby's blood. Mm. And then leave the room, you know, as an insect or whatever, and then usually fly out as it's usually a bird, a turkey. That's that's mm. usually the so bird she's got that a turkey she materializes. Feet. Right, right. Wow. Because chickens were introduced later, so mm-hmm. turkeys have always been there. Guajalote, that's what they call. It. That's an ad, the Aztec word for it. But um, so anyway, that's the Tlawalpuchi, and that's how it became known because this guy was noticing. On the death certificate, it's sucked by a witch is the cause of death. And then they, it's like someone in, what's the capital of Rhode Island? Providence? Yes, Mm -hmm. Providence. Mm -hmm. Someone in Providence, Rhode Island, not knowing what's happening in some other little village or town that's 20 minutes away or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's what was happening. There was this legend 
that no one even really knew about in the capital city. You had to be from this, this rural area. And that's how that legend became known. And um, then I come along and say, hey, that's a great story. And then I put it in English and I put it in a coloring book. And so now, yes. you know, so it's it's way out of the bag. The cat's way out of the bag now. You know? so, the turkey's mm -hmm. out of the bag. The turkey's out of the bag. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it was a way of explaining crib death, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Baby dies, yeah. I don't know why. It's the brew yeah, hot. Must be the, yeah. Yeah. Sucked by a witch. Mm. So oh. and then they yeah, have the whole mythology, but that's that's a Nahuatl word, Tlawil Puchi. Say that like ten times faster. Right? <laughs> and they believe that this Legend goes back just like the Nawal. It goes back 2,000 years or more. There's no wow. time immemorial. They would have no idea of knowing how old this is. That's a very interesting. Yeah. There's a picture of yeah. the Nawal in here, too. Isn't this it? The cat dog thing? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's it. And uh, Priestess of Wonderland uh, said in chat, too, that the Bali Yaga, the Bali Yaga has a house, house with, with chicken, chicken feet. feet. Yeah. And oh, so that's really? just that's from like European. Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that weird? How did that happen? So you still have this chicken feet <laughs> thing happening in Eastern Europe and then also happening in Central America. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> well, I got another <laughs> so, question for you. Yeah. You brought up Providence, Rhode Island, and we had a guest on before, our friend Joe Cunningham, who mm -hmm. actually dealt with, uh, uh, did a story there on uh, vampires that they found in Rhode Island, uh, burials that were uncovered with, uh, uh, that well, basically they were afraid they were going to come back to life, that they're vampires, and so they had been staked and all of these things. What Do we have any, uh, any stories of the, of the undead? In, in Mexico, is that something that was feared? People coming back alive? Well, hmm, that's an interesting question because I, I haven't really come across any of that stuff. You had to worry about the spirits of the dead, mm -hmm. but not actually physical people coming back. Vampires, the vampire legend has, there have been vampires spotted in Mexico along the lines of the Western vampire mm -hmm. in modern times. Mm -hmm. But as far as like a tradition of the dead walking again or whatever, mm, not that I know of, but the mm -hmm. spirits you have to worry about, like, um, like during an eclipse, for example, like what just happened, the Aztecs, one of their beliefs about eclipses is that there are these spirits of dead warriors who are there battling the sun mm. and they can come down during an eclipse and be like, I, I don't know. I get this image in my mind of Jason and the Argonauts, the battle with the skeletons, because they're basically the same sort of thing. These skeletal creatures that come down and will battle with you. But um, as far as, yeah, the walking dead or zombies, I, I haven't seen anything like that. That doesn't mean that they don't exist mm -hmm. or they, yeah. they're not in, you know, there could be some native group that I haven't explored deeply their mythology or their religious beliefs. But yeah, as far as I know, I haven't come across anything yet. Well, there we go. If you're, uh, if you're listening to this show and you have, uh, and you have knowledge of that, leave it in the comments, let us know. And, and we'll yeah. pass that along. Yeah, it could be something else. I'll be, be right on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a question earlier from Lunar Paloma. Um, is there a deer man, body of a man with a head of a deer with antlers? That comes from the Yaki tradition. The Yaki's were, um, well, they are a people in the northern deserts of Mexico and some refugees cross the border to um, Arizona and there's at least one. I think there are two small reservations in Arizona for the Yaki, but it's a very vibrant culture. And during during the Easter time, there there's the deer dance. So there's 
the head of a deer's, you know, a guy dresses up in a costume and that's part of the Easter celebrations. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really looked into that, but it's a it's a main uh, symbol of their their tribe, actually, and their culture. Mm -hmm. So there is this deer man that's that's in that tribe, I know for sure. And it's connected with Easter. Mm. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You're a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Right? Yeah. So it, it seems like things just stick to me, you know, that yeah. all this weird stuff just, mm -hmm. it, just once it comes in my head, it's hard for me to, to forget <laughs> it. I don't know. Well, but I try to why, integrate all of it. Yeah, I, that's why I, you're I try here, to because we like the weird yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so many episodes. So so once again, we're kind of getting close. We're getting close to the end. Do you have any? Uh, uh, Jenny might have another question, but uh, just to kind of put that out there again, uh, uh, Mexico Unexplained uh, over on YouTube. Uh, go there, give it a, a follow, subscription over there. Uh, there's so much content, and if you enjoyed hearing the stories uh, tonight, um, you can go over there and check out a whole lot more. And you said you're also on TikTok, Robert, too. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a whole intro. That's a whole other <laughs> world. Okay, it is. Because yeah. it, it seems like the people on TikTok are under 25. You yes, know? and babies. they have no attention span. No. Like one comment said. Gosh, you've got to speed up this guy's content. <laughs> and I was like, this is 53 seconds. 50, put it on. <laughs> and I said to one of them, I said, you know, talking to them like their dad, because I'm old enough to be their dad, right? I said, okay, so what are you going to do? Put it on double speed so you'll listen to it in 26 seconds. So with that extra time, you can wake up a little bit later tomorrow morning. Is that what? <laughs> <laughs> so you know um it's an interesting you know the oh gosh <laughs> it's interesting i'm it, it's a whole other audience to be exposed to but i'm glad i'm there and people are telling me that they're glad that i'm there Good. because they enjoy the content and they they wanted more meaningful content. I get a lot of yeah. compliments, mm -hmm. but the comment sections there can just go crazy. And, you know, so, yeah, I'm on TikTok and I'm on it pretty much everything else too, like Instagram and, um, you know, of course, YouTube. I'm on Facebook. Mm -hmm. My Facebook exploded with the eclipse because I did an eclipse show and I had 2.3 million views Wow. on my facebook post yeah about the eclipse i've never seen numbers like that That's and awesome. i yeah i got a lot of uh, new people on the day of the eclipse i did not expect that at all it but, opened um, it opened everybody's heart to the weirdness there we go <laughs> yes <laughs> yep yeah so i'm pretty much everywhere and like i said i'm i love talking to people and discussing this stuff and some people are reluctant to reach out to me with an mm -hmm. idea or whatever i'll talk mm -hmm. to anybody I, one of the first people who reached out to me was a 12 year old boy from utah who was doing a a, a report for one of his classes about the chupacabra oh, cool. and i was like yeah i'm glad to talk to you yeah sure <laughs> there you go so i'll talk to anybody if you I mean, some people are working on research projects. Some people have ideas. Some people have stories that they might be reluctant to share with people. I'll listen mm -hmm. to you. And, you know, if you want me to make the story public, I'll do it. If you just want to bounce it off me, that's fine, too. Awesome. I've had people I've heard had people share their abduction stories, their paranormal encounters. And a lot of it is just going to stay right here because I've. I made my promises. So mm -hmm. you, I'd love to hear about whatever anybody wants to talk to me about. So I'm always accessible. Awesome. Yeah. Some, sometimes when you've seen something firsthand and you haven't heard it before, it can be comforting to know that, yeah, I've actually heard about something like that before. You're not absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> just knowing that someone else, you know, can kind of set, set the mind mm -hmm. at ease to a certain extent. So 
there we go folks if you are um if, if you're looking for robert uh i will have all of the the links uh down below in the uh in the uh info section there so you can click and uh, find uh robert at all those places and be able to go uh, check out all the content that's being made there uh we really enjoyed having you on again tonight um I imagine we'll try to do another one down the road sometime. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. It was fun once again. And yeah, I'd love to be on another time or several other times in the future. There was another whole to like a uh, topic. I, we didn't even get to, I had written down. So. <laughs> well, okay. You're next just, time. You're, yeah, you're just have to come back again. <laughs> Before we head off, uh, what, what well, what are some things that you're planning on working on? What what do you have what do you have coming up down the road? Gosh, there there's some ghost stories that I'm looking at, and um, some other ancient ruins type things. Mm. Like I said about the Maya, there are things that are being uncovered all the time, and awesome. it's a it's a thing that's close to my heart because I actually. It was part of an excavation of a Maya site. We can talk about that some other time. Yeah. But um, yeah, so there's there's always stuff that I'm looking at. And um, yeah, on my next buying trip, I'm sure I'm going to be stumbling across other things, too, that I, I'm going to bring to the English speaking world. So, yeah, there's always something going on. I have a question about your business before we leave, mm -hmm. because I think I wanted to ask this last time and I didn't. Um, so you had mentioned that like like that your story at the end of the last episode with you on was talking about like there was uh the product the production for the movie was had bought a bunch of your stuff but can like just anybody like you go on to a website or something and just buy something you know from yeah, your yeah. yeah so it's not just like and like uh, it's not just like companies or productions or stuff it's, it's like anybody can go and buy right. stuff and then you yeah, ship it all over the place yeah, 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 everywhere. Um, I have a wholesale catalog in case anybody has a retail store or whatever, you know, I oh, do yeah. wholesale mm -hmm. like that. But um, I'm one of the oldest, if not the oldest. I know for sure I'm the longest lasting person on the entire Internet to be selling Latin American arts and crafts. When I did this in 1999, I had so much pushback from people because people... I mean, what percentage of the, the world was online? Not very many. Yeah. I mean, not very many people. And so back then, people were saying to me, well, you know, these arts and crafts, people have to pick them up and look at them and feel them and all of this stuff. And I said, well, how can you do that if you're in Indiana or if you're in Australia? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so I said, I'm going to do this. And so on September 16th, when I flicked the switch for the lights of my store, my website went live. So I and I think I was the very first to be selling this sort of stuff online. But like I said, if I wasn't the first, I'm the longest. I'm the last one standing from the late 90s, early 2000s. So because of that, I mean, I have to give credit where credit is due because I've started so early. There are like tens of thousands of links to my business. Oh, yeah. And so because it just snowballed over time. If I wanted to start that business now, I'd have a heck of a time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so to your question, anybody can buy the stuff. And and the whole genesis of Mexico Unexplained is because I was going down trying to freshen up my merchandise and pushing the limits and going to the remote places that maybe some other stores or whatever wouldn't go to. Yeah. And there's so few places that are buying, you know, arts and crafts now and mm -hmm. reselling them. But so that's what started the whole Mexico unexplained thing because of this craft business that is still here. I, I can't believe, I mean, this, <laughs> this September will be 25 years Wow. Jeez. Yeah. So I'm still doing that. And that takes me down, you know, the mm -hmm. next buying trip I go on. I haven't planned it yet, but I'm sure I'll stumble across some creature, some UFO <laughs> landing site, some nice. ghost. 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. So a uh, website for that is sueñosimports.com. Yes. And then I'm oh, also on eBay, um, eBay, Amazon. You know, I have a Shopify store, eBay, Amazon, Etsy. I'm all over the place. So excellent. Yeah, you can. Anyway, all right. Yeah, so. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, stick around. We're going to we're going to hang out with our Twitch, uh, Twitch friends a little bit more. But for everybody who's listening in podcast form, uh, thank you for joining us. And we will see you all next time. Bye.